And today we are delighted to welcome Maria del Rosario Zavala and Julia Maria Aguirre. Maria is an American born daughter of Peruvian immigrants, a mother and an associate professor of elementary education at San Francisco State University. She studied mathematics at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and almost became a high school math teacher before working in elementary education. Across her 20 plus year career in education, she has worked in classrooms across the K-12 spectrum and supported teachers' professional learning in a variety of contexts. In addition to work on the role of racial and other socially constructed identities in learning mathematics, a large part of her research agenda includes defining, expanding, and evolving ideas of cultural, culturally responsive mathematics teaching, in particular, the impact of CRMT on teachers and students. Julia Maria Aguirre is a biracial Chicana activist, math educator, scholar, and teacher educator. Her parents were educators and activists integrating faith, community, and justice growing up. Julia is a professor of education at the University of Washington, Tacoma. Her work focuses on critical equity studies in mathematics education, teacher education, and culturally responsive mathematics pedagogy. She has taught mathematics in formal and informal classroom settings. A primary goal of her work is preparing new generations of teachers to make mathematics education accessible, meaningful, and relevant to today's youth. And now, please welcome Maria and Julia. Yay! Thank you so much for being here, everyone. Um, Hi, everyone. Before we get into it, um, we wanted to take a moment to recognize some of the contributors to the book who we invited to join us here today. We kind of enjoyed, we invited them at the last minute because life is busy and we got those invites out late. But I wanted just to give a, a moment to allow Melissa and Holly and Caitlin, and I don't know if we missed you, Olivia, if you are here, and um, Talia, if you are also here, um, to just say uh, hello and wave to you and feel free to, to um, maybe unmute and just say hi to the audience if you like, um, because the book is really a team effort. And inviting just Julia and I to talk, we realized we really needed to bring in our, our co-authors with us too. So thank you for coming. Um, I also sent the email, I wouldn't put you on the spot and make you talk about your chapters, but did you just wanna like say hello and maybe where you're tuning in from today and any other little comments you wanna add? Um, Melissa, did you want to say something? <laughs> hey everybody, I'm Melissa Adams Corral. I'm so excited to be here and to get to celebrate this book coming out and to celebrate Maria and Julia and their labor of love across the years. I'm joining y'all from the Rio Grande Valley in South Texas, and I'm here to be a listener and learner and also a participant. Hey, thank you. Holly, did you want to jump in? Hi, I'm Holly Tate. I'm also um, really excited about this and just so um, I feel, I feel so lucky to have been a part of this work and can't wait to learn uh, more about it tonight. Um, I'm joining from Virginia, uh, really close to DC. So I'm excited to be here. Awesome. And Caitlin, thank you so much for being here. Did you want to say hello and add anything? Hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin Kaplowitz. I am also joining in from Northern Virginia. Um, and I'm really excited um, to be a part of this book and to hear more about it tonight and learn more. Thanks. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> okay. And before we get too far into it, let's go ahead. Okay. So, um, and I think some other, our additional co-authors might be joining us late. So we'll just keep an eye out for folks. Um, we first though want to recognize that um, all of our lives and institutions exist on indigenous land. And if you, uh, we just went through um, no, the, um, the month of November and November is Native American Heritage Month. Um, so we want to acknowledge um, the land that we are on and um, that we are on the ancestral homelands of those who walked here before us and those who still walk here. And for me, these lands are the, um, 
uh, the lands of the Coast Salish people. And um, when I'm on my campus, it's specifically the Puyallup Tribe of Indians uh, land that I am on. And when I am at home, it's the Muckleshoot and Snoqualmie people's lands. Um, for Maria, it's the Muwekem, the Muwekme Ohlone tribe. Um, and we invite you to acknowledge the indigenous lands that you currently occupy. So please feel free to um, put that in the chat. Uh, we are grateful uh, to respectfully live and work as guests on these lands. And we believe we have the moral responsibility to acknowledge our indigenous connections, as well as the histories of dispossession, genocide and forced removal that have allowed for the growth and survival of our institutions and those that surround us. Let us continue to take active efforts to advocate for and partner with our indigenous neighbors as we engage in our work together as a community of educators, leaders, and learners. So again, um, we uh, want, we are grounded in this land and the work that we do, we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, and just want you to take a moment and reflect on whose ancestral lands you are currently occupying. Thanks, and I just also want to acknowledge that Talia Kemper was able to join us as a panelist too. She's the co-author on chapter nine about culturally responsive math teaching in, in special education classroom spaces. And so thank you, Talia, for, for coming by. Did you want to say something today too? I don't want to put you on the um, spot. Hi, <laughs> so I'm glad everyone's here. I'm from Oakland, California, up the street from where Maria is. Um, I just was really excited to write this chapter. Any of you who are in special ed or work with kids with disabilities know that there isn't a lot of research around um, mathematics or on integrating um, the cultural or different languages into teaching of students with disabilities. So it was a really fun chapter to write. And I um, will be here for a, little, a few minutes, but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have over email um, about special ed. Thanks. Awesome, thank you. And maybe drop your email in the chat before you leave. And I'm sure lots of people will be excited to connect with um, all of you co-authors as well. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and invite our um, co-author panel to, um, if you'd like to return to participation mode for the webinar, uh, feel free to. And then um, we'll continue with the presentation and, and talking about the book. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and invite us all to just for a moment listen. This is a vignette that we feature in the text, as well as one that was co-authored with a fourth grade teacher in Oakland that we published in another NCTM publication as well. Uh, and we wanted to start here just to invite you to reflect on the mathematical learning happening in this vignette. The text is small. It's there for me to read to you. So feel free to just listen and imagine for a moment. Inside a fourth grade classroom at a community charter school in Oakland, California, 20 students are in small groups around the room with markers, pencils, papers, rulers, and other materials spread across their tables. They are fluently switching back and forth between Spanish and English as they take measurements and mark up maps. The children are working on a school community math project, redesigning their school's future fifth grade classroom building and play space. Each team is tasked to provide a list of recommendations along with visual maps to help the architect generate plans for the building remodel. A small group of students huddle around a map of their school's future space. The map is produced on grid paper and sits in front of another piece of paper with a four column chart labeled surface, square yards, fraction, and purpose. As they talk, they gesture towards their paper, tracing lines on a map with pencils and markers. The energy level is high as students encourage one another's ideas. So what do we want to do in this space? I think we should make a hangout zone or wait maybe and a stage, but maybe it'll be smaller than that, chimes in another student, tapping the map and gesturing with her hands, holding them about shoulder width apart. I don't want the stage area to be too big, but wait, oh, 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 I got it. Maybe this part could be the stage and this part the audience, a student asks, tracing a straight line to the group's largest open space on their map. But, make, but wait, we don't want to make it indoor. We really want it outdoor. Yeah, they all agree, outdoor. And as the discussion continues, the three students fill in the surface column with words like asphalt, grass, wooden stage, and trampoline. They get up from their seats and visit the class's paper representation of one square yard that's taped on the ground. They discuss how much space they need for each area, what kind of surface they would want, and calculate the fraction of the total area of the outdoor space using a previously calculated number of total 
square yards. As you listen to just this tiny snippet of interaction, I hope you could feel the activity and the energy coming off of the page. How often does mathematics instruction look like this or feel like this? And the question that's really driving the book for me is how can mathematics instruction center children and their ideas in significant ways, right? So we come to this work thinking about what we would like classroom spaces to be like, but beyond that also just what is mathematics and mathematical learning and how is it significant for ourselves and the families that we serve? Julia? Thanks, Maria. So this um, this representation here are things that sort of inspire the work that we were doing. The um, representation on the left um, is a uh, a painting um, by a Chicano artist named Jake Prendes here in the Pacific Northwest, and actually he gave his permission to use this this image um, on page fifty of our of our book to uh, um, introduce an activity around the roots of humanizing mathematics. And the idea here is that we, uh, you know, many people have have talked about math being something that everyone does and has been done, been done since time immemorial, and that we have ancestral knowledge around mathematics. Um, and that sometimes um, the one of the challenges is that, um, schools have not recognized necessarily that history um, and ways to bridge um, the school mathematics with the ancestral knowledge and the the funds of knowledge that that children bring to to school um, and so this particular uh, image is something that is to remind us just how far back um, our our work um, and our knowledge goes with mathematics and that it's always around us and it's always with us. Um, and so this is a very a powerful image for me around thinking um, of the role of, of math and how it, it impacts our, our, our memory and our, and our connection with who we are as people. And on the right side is, a, it's a picture that I took of a mural by Raphael Tapia III. Um, and I took this picture in a park in Oakland where there was an exhibit of street murals that had been put up over the boards that were put up over businesses that were broken into and smashed and suffered some damage after um, a summer of really lots of bubbling, rising, um, racialized stress around what happened with killings of Black folks. And this particular piece of art really um, struck out to me because I, at the time I was in the process of working on this book with Julia, and we were thinking a lot about how in mathematics, we're often very concerned with thinking and the head, right? And um, we were trying to make these connections though to the heart, right? And bringing mathematics into the heart as a way to both humanize mathematics, but also to think um, a little bit more broadly about what counts as mathematics and where does math live and um, how, how is it embodied? And what spoke to me also in this piece of work is the idea of like, when we start to build those connections, when we take mathematics from the head and start to connect it to the heart, we also open up to the to the power of, of what's in our hearts, right? Compassion, empathy, understanding, um, being compelled towards action and things like that. So, um, that's a little bit about, for me, what the whole goal of mathematical hearts is, is to really think from, from a new center, right? It's not that mathematical thinking is not important. It's incredibly important. But if we start to center on cultivating the heart, um, we open ourselves up to even more powerful mathematics um, possibilities. And the, the the quote in the middle is, again, sort of, um, taking a you know a connection to Bettina Love's work around the role joy plays. Again, thinking about um, that empathy, that that emotion, that the compassion, and that love. Um, and so, what is joy? Where is joy fit in this work? Um, and you know, she has this powerful quote around joy is crucial 
for social change and joy is crucial for teaching. And so both those things can happen and should happen together to cultivate joy. And for us, again, it's cultivating mathematical heart. So we want to take you now just a little bit into the organization of the book um, as also a way to talk about uh, the ideas in here and why they're in here. Um, so just to give you the quick overview, if you haven't had a chance to look at it yet, um, the book is organized into two parts. The first part is really to give you that um, foundational support, your understanding of the definitions, the concepts, and the principles that we build the book around. Um, we thought it was really important to start with purposes and principles because Often culturally responsive teaching in general is positioned as an add-on to the work of teaching. It's like there's teaching and then there's culturally responsive teaching. And um, many, many teachers, scholars, and educators have been arguing that it's actually, it's not, it's not an add-on. It's a question of where you want to center, right? So we begin with this idea of purposes and principles of culturally responsive math teaching. Um, then we introduce um, a culturally responsive math teaching tool that we have used um, both in research and in teaching ourselves um, the, that helps to be both a tool for reflection as well as a tool for planning and a tool for analysis in general. Finally, we break apart that tool into the following three chapters, chapters three, four, and five, which each embody one of the strands that we are calling um, central to culturally responsive math teaching. We will tell you more about the strands in a moment, but we wanted to just tell you a little bit about how the book is organized first. Each of the chapters also contains a detailed description of the strand and the dimensions that make it up. Professional learning activities that we have used both in professional learning context, in our math methods classes that we teach, also activities we've tried on our own, and then short teaching stories to give you just a glimpse into the possibilities. One of the challenges I think that we faced when writing this book also is it's very tricky um, to think about like what you include as examples of teaching, right? Because we're very aware and also wary of how examples often are elevated to exemplars. And one of the things we're really trying to argue in this book, and other people also argue in theirs, is that while we want to give you a little glimpse into what could be, a lot of it is really about what's happening in your context and how you operationalize these ideas in your own setting, right? But for example, we have an activity here that illustrates both how we hope the book to be both self-reflective tool for teachers and also a tool for taking action in your own classroom. Um, this one is about telling new stories and reframing stories to take on um, status and power issues in mathematics. And part two. And part two. So um, we are so fortunate to have um, collaborated with some amazing guest authors um, that you see here on the screen and some of which are here with us, um, where we wanted to have uh, um, professional teacher leaders um, who utilize and think about this in, in their own classroom settings um, and ask them to connect with um, and, it, and sort of elaborate what the CRMT, what culturally responsive math teaching looks like in their classroom. Um, utilizing the tool that we um, that we have created um, in a in a variety of ways, and it was really important for us to um, acknowledge that uh, CRMT can be be is a part of 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 all can be part of all mathematics education as an integrated part, um, and it's often uh, sometimes not recognized in particular areas. So it was really important for us especially in the programs that we're teaching, um, to include um, examples of what CRMT looks like in dual language settings or in bilingual elementary settings and also in special education settings. Those are really two places that sometimes it just doesn't get as much attention um, when we're talking about math education. And so, um, and then the first two chapters are, again, um, really appreciate the work uh, of Holly Tate who, who um, uh, co-authored these two chapters with um, with her teacher colleagues um, around thinking about the ways in which CRMT can help you uh, customize um, district-created lesson plans um, that take into consideration and center children, um, that uh, uh, scaffold and affirm um, uh, multilingual learners, uh, 
and also um, engage students in thinking about power and participation in different ways. Um, and she she utilized that with both a primary grade teacher, Olivia, and also a fourth grade teacher who she had a um, longstanding collaborative relationship with um, as a coach. Uh, and um, in both cases, you get a, a sense of just overall ways in which you can look, you can drill down into a particular lesson and also how this work evolves over time in chapter seven. Um, and so it... I feel like one of the things that the that the book does is, you know, take some ideas, um, research based theoretical sort of ideas with activities that we have developed and have utilized and, and worked with teachers to to think about strongly and then um, engage them and 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 uh, be able to deep do deeper dives in particular education contexts. And we have, you know, amazing chapters written by our guest authors who really take us in a deep um a deep way to look at how this how this works with with kids yeah i just moved on to the next slide because i thought it was a nice connection to you were talking about going deeply um mm -hmm. there's an example here do you want to continue explaining this go ahead. one no you can go ahead awesome yeah so just to say that um in as an example of what Julia is talking about, like going deeply and giving you specific examples, um, this is an example from chapter six, where they're talking about um, uh, designing a, a lesson um, with a modified task, right? So the curriculum gave them a specific a lesson and a specific task they were supposed to do. And in thinking more about what would be relevant and relatable to students in this in their classroom context, they ended up modifying the lesson to focus more on an example of um, protests and mathematizing pictures of people attending protests. So they were still hitting on their same math ideas, their core concepts of estimation and calculation, um, but they shifted the context into one where children could relate in different ways, um, especially back to the to the head and the heart connection, right? Um, and then had students produce, um, asked students to produce quite interesting um, conclusions that used both mathematics and um, and their ideas about how and when people protest. So, so we wanted to um, back up for a second also. So that's a little bit about what's in the book, but we wanted to also center on um, three guiding principles that we start the book with. Um, again, for me, um, it comes back to these principles um, because as we engage in culturally responsive math teaching, we might be really hungry for the specifics of like, well, how do I do it? How do I do it? We often hit moments where we have to make decisions either in the classroom because something has just happened and we have to make a decision of what direction we want to go or in planning, right? Or when working with our curriculum to adapt it. Um, and so we wanted to propose some principles that help us say, okay, when I'm faced with a decision, um, what do I come back to, right? Like, what am I really trying to do here? And so um, we proposed these particular guiding principles to help us make decisions about what we would, um, where we want to center ourselves in teaching. Um, the first is to acknowledge that our current system of mathematics education is inequitable and oppressive. And I think sometimes, the cultural part of culturally responsive math teaching can feel like it it doesn't necessarily take on that oppression piece, right? That it doesn't dig into that power dynamic. And so we wanted to start with saying like, actually, no, this is really what it's about, right? Um, culturally responsive math teaching is, um, is, is what it is trying to be. It is at its best when we're also decision-making around engaging and dismantling that system. It, it can be a real help in that, right? And so the second is taking actions that center students and their families inside and outside the mathematics classroom. So again, if we're at these decision-making points where we're like, well, we could do this or we could do that, and there's a pathway you could take that really helps you towards that action of centering students and their families, that helps us ground ourselves in that idea. And then finally, to be accountable to ourselves, our children, our families, and our communities, right? So this idea of acknowledge, take action, and accountability um, is definitely one that we built on from um, 
from TOTOS and NCSM's position statement on social justice. That was then expanded into a position statement on anti-racism and math education in 2020, uh, where they have that structure of acknowledgement, action, and accountability. And we brought that structure also into our guiding principles. Yes. Okay. All right. So what we'd like you to do is to think about a lesson or something that you've either taught yourself or have um, maybe um, in your capacity, maybe as a coach sort of um, worked with uh, being able to provide professional feedback or or maybe even your work with pre-service teachers. Um, and I want you to think about these, these essential questions that we have here listed. So how does my lesson help students connect math to relevant and authentic issues or situations in their lives? How does my lesson support creativity and broaden what counts as math knowledge and affirm positive math identities? How does my lesson create opportunities to elicit, express, and build on student math thinking in multiple ways? And then how does my lesson enable my students to closely explore and analyze math concepts, processes, and problem-solving strategies? How does it maintain high rigor and high support for all the students that I work with? And then how does my, my lesson make space for multilingual learners to be central to the math activities that I teach? And the final three questions, again, is, is thinking about how my math lessons distribute math authority and make space, it, space for multiple forms of knowledge and communication. How does my lesson disrupt status differences, entrenched stereotypes, and inequitable power relationships present in all math classrooms? Because math classrooms, as we know, are not immune to the social forces that are impacting our life, our schools, our society. So how is my lesson disrupting those, those concerns, those, those forces? Um, and how does my lesson encourage the use of mathematics to analyze, critique, and address power relationships and injustice in their lives? And this can be from an economic, social, environmental justice, legal, political, patriarchal um, uh, facets. And we will explain later the colors that um, are connected to these essential questions. But we open up the, the book with thinking about how our lessons are doing these things. Yeah, and maybe as you look over these questions, there are some that you could say, well, my lesson didn't really do the, the lesson I'm thinking about, or, or my lesson did this pretty well. Um, and um, we are going to, I mean, I will, I will not bury the lead and say um, the answer should not be for every single one of these that like, I'm amazing and I did all these things in every lesson, but our our challenge to everyone and one of the, and the main idea of the tool in the book is to be constantly bringing up these kinds of questions in planning and reflection and analysis of our own teaching, right? Not because we should be checking every box and saying we do stellar on all these all the time, but because if we're not acknowledging where we are at with these concepts and we aren't taking action to adjust um, in future lessons, um, then we're never gonna get to that point, right? So this is a lot to me also about asking these questions is a lot to me also about accountability um, to ourselves. <clears throat> okay, so we always like to offer an actual definition of culturally responsive mathematics teaching. Um, both in case you are newer to the idea, but also because maybe you already have a definition that you operate with. And so we wanted to share one that we center the work in this book on. And our definition of culturally responsive math teaching is, it involves a set of specific pedagogical knowledge, dispositions and practices that privilege mathematics, mathematical thinking, cultural and linguistic funds of knowledge and issues of power and social justice in mathematics education. Culturally responsive mathematics teaching interrogates and innovates mathematics instruction to be a transformative and humanizing experience for everyone. And I'd like to underscore that the, the everyone is not just the children we teach, but teachers too, right? We can make math classrooms a place where it's humanizing for both students and teachers. So we also, you know, 
we we try to I think it's really important that the the roles that I think Maria and I play in our scholarship has always really tried to connect theory and practice together. And the work that we do um, continues to um, ground the work in um, theory and research. Um, and it's important to understand what the roots are, for us, what the roots are for um, cultural responsive math teaching. So we describe sort of three big areas in the field um, that contribute to how we're conceptualizing culturally responsive math teaching. The first one is pedagogical content knowledge. Um, and that's the knowledge that we need to teach mathematics. It's not the math knowledge itself, but it's the math, the knowledge we need to teach math. Um, and then there's culturally responsive pedagogies that have been grounded in multicultural ed and liberatory pedagogies. Um, we we uh, rely heavily on the work of Geneva Gay, um, who coined the term culturally responsive pedagogy. We also connect very um, closely with um, uh, Gloria Latson Billings' work, work on um, culturally relevant pedagogy. Um, and then the third area is rehumanizing mathematics. And we, you know, there's been work done on humanizing and rehumanizing mathematics, but we draw on uh, Rochelle Gutierrez's work a, a lot in um, thinking about how we can rehumanize math and um, recognize its role that it plays in um, in our in our world and and who we are as people. Um, and I I really love um, Rochelle's Gutierrez um, uh, quote when she talks about um, uh, you know people need math, but math actually needs people. And so it's a very humanizing um, uh, way of thinking about this uh, this 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 topic. Um, and that it's been a part of us and will continue to be a part of us. And we can we need to continue to to humanize and rehumanize that that um, um, that concept. So those are the three areas that connect to um, the culturally responsive math teaching um, work that we draw on. Okay, so um, we wanted to give you a moment also to access and have a look at the culturally responsive math teaching tool and how it's organized. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and I think we were gonna place in the chat the direct link. It's actually available at the Corwin website to be perfectly honest. So I'm gonna post the link there if you'd like. And if you scroll down on the right, you actually will find um, I'm going to just do a quick demo. Let's see if I can get there. So here we are on the website, right? Um, one of the things we made available was a free resource. Is it? No, I'm in the wrong place. Sorry, everyone, bear with me. This is the part that I forgot to prepare and look up. Um, if you scroll down, right, if you scroll down, um, there are the related resources. And it's right here. It's the Cultivating Mathematical Hearts, CRMT2 or tool, <laughs> the second T is the tool. Uh, if you click on that, you'll be able to access a copy of the full um, culturally responsive math teaching uh, lesson analysis tool in its entirety. And we're gonna go um, look at it more closely from a bird's eye view, but I wanted to make sure you had access to that link. Okay, so again, you go to the Corwin website for the book. On In my case, you scroll all the way down to the bottom and then you look at the related resources and you have access to the tool right there. So a little bit about it while you while you get access and pull it in front of you if you'd like. Um, the way that it's designed is we were thinking a lot about the metaphor of weaving, right? So culture responsive mathematics teaching highly depends on your context, but there are these still these, these items that make it um, actually culturally responsive. Right. And when we weave together the things that make a lesson or a unit or our classrooms culturally responsive spaces, then we start to get um, a beautiful, a beautiful piece of art, essentially um, something strong that we can really um, build opportunities to learn around. So I want you just to keep that weaving uh, metaphor in mind as we talk about these various dimensions of culturally responsive math teaching. 
Okay. Um, oh, also, we wanted to do the metaphor of weaving in part because of how weaving is such a central part of Indigenous knowledge all over the world, right? So um, from where my parents come from, uh, my home country of Peru, there's a long tradition of textiles and weaving all over South America, Central America, and other um, countries. There are these long traditions, right? Um, so we really wanted to bring that in because of the significance also to um, to humans about uh, weaving and the power of, of, of weaving together. Okay, so this is our bird's eye view. I don't know if you just heard my son yell, what is this? But that's, that's fine. <laughs> Um, this is our bird's eye view of the tool that you have. So um, it is our culture responsive math teaching tool is organized into three strands. The strands are knowledges and identities, rigor and support and power and participation. And these three strands each have three components or three dimensions, if you like, that help uh, define them, right? The very first strand, knowledges and identities is first for a reason. Um, and it's because for us, it is very important, like you can't call it culturally responsive teaching if you aren't centering cultural and community funds of knowledge somehow, right? So that's why we start from there. Um, so centering cultural community funds of knowledge, rehumanizing mathematics because it's, you know, historically been used as a tool to dehumanize um, and to honor student thinking and ideas is that first strand. The second one brings us back into thinking a lot about maintaining the rigor while also providing access and support. And that's where we have the dimensions of sustaining cognitive demand, scaffolding up, bringing kids into the challenge as opposed to watering it down and affirming multilingualism, which is really about ensuring that multilingual learners are positioned to both be contributors and um, to have opportunities themselves to learn in the classroom. And finally, power and participation. And I probably should stop saying, and finally, because again, think of the weaving, they all actually have to go together, right? Um, but these are dimensions that often are not as explicitly uh, engaged with, in, especially in the elementary teaching classroom, but I would actually probably argue in most mathematics classrooms, right? Which is about um, taking stock of distributing that intellectual authority. Is everyone really having the opportunity to be the authority in the classroom or does knowledge tend to center with teachers? Um, disrupting status and power, how are those entrenched stereotypes or unequal power relations playing out in your classroom and what can you do about it, right? And then finally, analyzing and taking action, meaning positioning mathematics as a tool to analyze, critique, and address power relationships and injustices um, in our students' and families' own lives. And the colors have some significance. Yeah, so... Um... The colors were chosen on purpose, and um, they actually are connected to Mardi Gras colors. So um, anybody from New Orleans in the webinar, you can just put your, say, hey. Um, but green is actually the color for faith. And gold is the color for power. And purple is the color for justice. And it's those three colors that we thought and we were thinking around um, that the, that significance actually matters in the work that we're doing of faith, knowledge, and, and justice. And so that that connects to the colors. And so the different ways in which we we are um, in the book, uh, we had to choose a color. <laughs> so we call, we chose purple. <laughs> um, uh, but you do get a, the full color a version of the tool is available on the website. Um, and the full color uh, um, uh uh, framework here is also available on the inside cover. Um, and we also want to recognize that I think we come to this work recognizing that everybody, every educator, math teacher, educator, um, starts someplace on this, on this framework. Like everybody's doing something connected to culturally responsive math teaching. Um, and so part of the work is is beginning to recognize, okay, where are my strengths here in this frame? And then where what what am I doing that um, I'm going to really, when I look at these different um, dimensions and the strands, where, where what's going to stretch me? 
And um, those are the things that I think um, as, as, as educators, as teachers, we need to, to think about what are our strengths and recognizing that we are on somewhere on here and what are, what is, what's going to stretch. Um, and so we don't come in, at this work thinking that, oh, no one's doing cultural response and not teaching. We do want to recognize that we are all, we're doing something um, in contribution to promoting this work. Um, and so that's, I think, really important in the type of stances that we're taking and the and the work um, that we, uh, the chapters are doing to both um, help people understand what these strands are. And then in the guest chapters, look at that, what that looks like in action. Yeah, I also want to just highlight in particular, um, to build on that idea in chapter seven, there's some nice illustrations of that in, um, in Holly and Caitlin's chapter of this idea of like, where are you starting maybe with a particular lesson or because you know that this is a dimension that you haven't attended to very much. So you want to start there, but then what are the connections you can possibly build to, to really start weaving together these dimensions, right? So even this representation of the tool, I think can really serve as a map, a map for reflection, a map for planning, a map for thinking about how you traverse these dimensions and bring them together. Um, okay, so what do the, what is the organization, what is this rubric thing we have here, right? So, um, so each dimension is organized essentially as a rubric, but the rubric is really there for self-locating purposes, right? So it's to give us a sense of um, a framing from what it means to have a, a dimension that really needs development and what it means to be like, oh, this dimension is very strong in our lesson or in, in our or in our um, plan. So every dimension has um, on the kind of the left, we have like, what does it mean if this is present, but only fragile or marginally? And there's a short description to help you think about um, the kind of evidence and where it helps you land in this um, in this rubric. And then as we move up from a one to a five, that means that we have this dimension is more um, strongly centered or more clearly present as woven throughout the whole lesson, right? So as an example, starting with centering cultural and community funds of knowledge, one way to use a tool would be to say, okay, so I have my lesson plan in front of me that I'm gonna do. And I can ask myself this question, how does my lesson help students connect math with relevant or authentic issues or situations in their lives? And if straight off the bat, I see, well, the central task here is very disconnected. You can start to make decisions about how you'd like to adjust, right? Is it about a small redesign of the problem get centered? Is it about moving a question that's actually more relevant and covers similar mathematics that's in the student workbook into being the center for the lesson you do together? Or, or what is it, you know, but it helps you start to make decisions so that you move towards um, a five in this category, which would be the creation and maintenance of collective understandings about mathematics that involves intricate connections to cultural and community knowledge permeating the entire lesson. So this would include the hook, the intro, what are you planning to do to, to get started and get kids into this lesson and activate and talk about what they understand about the situation, right? How do you connect the head to the heart from the get-go? Um, and then having it permeate throughout the whole lesson, including that maybe when it's time to um, have students work on the task, the kinds of probing questions or engagement around the activity include things like, and why do you think this might be a good idea? What is What is it about your experience that's telling you that this is maybe what you should do with the numbers in that situation, right? So it's about really, really um, de de delving in deep. And this little diagram, this little drawing here of the arrow, if it bothers you, you can blame me because I did it. <laughs> it's just to remind you uh, to think about how you're actually weaving these kind of disparate pieces from um, being fragile and marginal in your lesson towards being very strong and strongly present um, in that strand, all right? What are we doing with time right now? Okay, I think we're good. Yeah, so, I mean, we have various things for you to um, uh, to to offer you as part of the to a part of the book. The book actually, um, the website that that Corin offers has a, an actual study guide that um, can help you and your your PLC, your professional learning community um, use um, in conjunction with the 
um, with the book to engage in a book study or um, however you uh, might want to utilize that study guide. Um, we provide in chapter two, a CRMT confidence survey that we suggest that you take on early, um, take it, take it early in reading the book and then maybe take it later after you practice some things and see if those, if that confidence, um, um, changes over time. Um, we have the actual tool that, that, um, Maria was just sharing with us, um, that is a, is a, a quite detailed rubric across the different dimensions, um, that can help you think through, um, uh, your planning, um, uh, reflect on your, the enactment of a lesson. Um, and then some people have used it as a way to provide feedback, um, in peer evaluations, um, or, you know, coaching opportunities, um, it's a very flexible tool. Um, mm -hmm. I will say that what one of the things that we learned as a part of doing this work is um, no matter where you go on the that dimension, on that framework, it is important um, that you are in some way, shape or form are addressing a, an equity focused dimension. So for example, um, in our previous work, we had a uh, um, culturally responsive, uh, the connecting to CR, to culturally, of uh, cultural funds of knowledge um, in a um, in a more what, what I would call like hierarchical. It didn't mean, mean to be that way, but it was like dimension nine or eight, right? And so when people were given the choice, people often focused on mathematical thinking. Um, they might focus on um, uh, uh, distributing intellectual authority, but not necessarily talking about cultural response or uh, cultural funds of knowledge. And so what we were really trying to do is figure out a way where um, the strands are interrelated um, in strands that might be reflective in math reform um, types of practices um, and push them to be much more equitable focused and culturally responsive. Um, so, uh, the dimension, the the tool is designed to be flexible, but also to push you in thinking around and deepening your understandings of how do I, for example, affirm multilingual learners in my class, not just promote academic language in English, but how do we affirm multilingual learners and the 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 wonderful ways in which they are bringing to the table their understanding of mathematics and communicating that? Um, how do we affirm the language of love? That they are that they are learning, and home at home, and in their communities, and bring that as a part of the learning process in school. Um, and then we we also provide a uh, you know it's a it's a template around family funds of knowledge survey that teachers can use to um, get information um, that might be beneficial to customize the the curriculum to to change the context that might be more interesting. Um, right. to the students that you're to the students that you're working with or or um, more connected to the community that you're serving. Um, right. And so we invite you and really just honor the the place that families play in um, being resources for math teaching. And we build off the, you know, we, we are standing on the shoulders of many researchers who have come before. So that's like Marta Seville, uh, Rochelle Gutierrez, like we've talked about before, um, oh. you know, Geneva Gay, um, you know, lots of different people um, who who have really informed this work, um, uh, and and we want to share that with you and utilize tools that can help you um, integrate that back into your into your instruction. So that's that's the additional resources that we have. Yes, thank you, Rochelle, Lena, Danny Martin, Karen Mayfield Ingram. Absolutely. So she's just making sure that they know about your book. You know, yeah. uh, there's so many people <laughs> that we would love to, um, uh, and that we try to connect with in terms of the work that that people have done over the years. The of the impact of identity book is going to come out soon. <laughs> We're all excited for that for sure. Okay, so um, before we move to taking questions for a few minutes, we wanted to um, conclude with an excerpt from the poem "The Teacher Space." by Norm Mathematics. So Norm Maddox was a, a teacher and then a coach in San Francisco Unified School District for many, many, many years. Uh, he's still he's still with us. He's around. But um, in, his, in retirement, he's really um, 
amped up his poetry game. And so I wanted to make sure that we got to listen to Norm read this excerpt from his own poem, The Teacher Space, which is also the poem that we include in our um, epilogue. So I'm going to see, where is it queued up? Oops. I just, oh, here it is. Right. I will switch back to the words once I get this place, don't worry. Empathy is the thread woven through patterns of speech, remembering imagined threats of ridicule and disdain, resolved to open windows, sealed behind false bravado, fear wearing the rugged individual like a tent with bootstraps so strong they pull themselves up. Victims no longer silent, voices found becoming advocates for what is fair and just in a system weighted in favor of the privileged, preschooled, two-parented tradition. The teacher's heart beats, the memories of all the feelings of acceptance and alienation, of inclusion winning over exclusion, of rushing from the margins to the center of our attention. We are all welcome here. We are now. Right, and with that, we we'll just say thank you and take some questions if we have time. Thank you all for uh, coming, and we're we're happy to maybe answer a few questions or if you're curious about something. Um, I wanted to address one thing that I saw scroll by me quickly in the um, comments, which is somebody wrote, it would be wonderful if there was a curriculum, right? And I I want to say that I go a little bit back and forth. To begin with, I don't think there's ever going to be a curriculum that's going to be tailored to the needs of your students, given the population of your students and where your school is situated. And I'm saying you're like generally, like each of us, right? But there is definitely curricula that starts in a different place than others. So for me, it's like, we always need to individualize and adapt curriculum, but some curricula could help us a little more as from a starting point, it feels like than others. Certainly curricula that promotes problem solving that has mathematical modeling ideas in it somehow would probably start us from a different position, right? Than a curriculum that is overly teacher centric, that feels like it is a much heavier lift to open up spaces for um, children to be mathematical authorities. But it, it is something that that I, I think like, I'm I'm skeptical that we'll ever see a curriculum that really feels like it could be marketed in the way that we market curriculum in this country. So without like some revolution in how we think about curriculum, I'm very, I'm not sure we're gonna get that curriculum. You know what I'm saying? I feel like we're always gonna have to do some work to really tailor our lessons. Which I think raises the question also of like, so do we do this all the time, every day at the same, you know, high octane level? And um, I'm also not sure that we do. So I don't know, Julia, do you have any thoughts about what it looks like for implementation? And are we saying we have to teach a certain way all the time, every day to every minute? Uh, I would say that that's the antithesis of culturally responsive math teaching. I don't think you can, I mean, I don't think you can, you can standardize it. I think it's, not that it's about holistic it's about being able to be responsive to the to the families and communities and really centering those children and their brilliance and um i think connecting to something earlier people asked like how is math oppressive and how you know to be really clear we are many like the, uh, the dominant system in our in our schools right now is a tracking system and that system um, is grounded in policies and practices and research that was that was developed in the early 20th century and fueled the eugenics movement. And we're still using um, mechanisms to rank, sort, and segregate children. And if we continue to do that, using math as that as is as one of the tools, then um, culture responsive math teaching is a way to dismantle those things. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to, to have it fully be strong um, and have the 
of the the weave be able to you know to to, to fully realize that mm-hmm. um, we do need to dismantle the the oppressive structures that right now math um, uh, in our in our system um, supports. And so by engaging culturally responsive math teaching, you are engaging in dismantling academic apartheid. And that's what we hopefully will um, do with this work. And I think also like um, we wrote this book with elementary classrooms in mind in part because like that's where my heart is. My heart is in the elementary classroom. Um, And I think that in elementary spaces, we often think like, oh, well, tracking, that's a problem for middle and high school. Um, but it's not. It's actually every time we do ability grouping, every time we think like, well, I'm going to make new math groups based on how good each kid is counting or, wh- or whatever it is. In elementary, we often say it's in the name of meeting children where they're at. But we have to be very careful with that because the result when we rank and sort children is usually that we stymie their brilliance rather than successfully meet them where they're at. So I I have a very big tension with that. I have children in elementary school right now, and I think a lot about this. Um, And I do believe you have to be able to support children to learn skills and procedures and concepts that they need to know. Um, And sometimes it looks like some individualized support, but I worry about the dominance of a model that says we should be able to group kids by ability in order to quote unquote meet them where they're at. Particularly if we're using things like... um readiness tests that have been um, sort of de- developed um, with a uh, normalized curve. And, you know, our world isn't like that, right? And so we're, you, we're trying to stick children into um, slots um, and, try, and, and try and work really hard to, again, rank and sort earlier and earlier. And the, the fact is that kids aren't getting out of those ranking and sorting. And so that really impacts us. So what what we're doing is trying to create uh, an approach to mathematics teaching that completely challenges that particular structure. Thanks everyone for coming. And just a big thank you once again to Maria and Julia.